Hi guys, this is Dr. Pawan, your search educator on an academy platform and today we are going to talk about a new series that is Surgery Overloaded 10 MCQs in General Surgery. So in this, I will be discussing with you 10 MCQs and I will be discussing a couple of things which are related to it. So let's start without wasting any further time. The first MCQ which I have for you today is Identify the lesion which you see in this particular image. So here you have been shown an image of an investigation. So first of all, can you please tell me what is this investigation? So if you're trying to tell me that this is a patient who is suffering from like in which uh, you have done a thyroid scan. So you are absolutely correct. So what you're basically seeing in here, this is a thyroid scan. Now what I'm trying to ask you is what have been shown in this thyroid scan? So do you see a cold nodule, a hot nodule, a warm nodule or a normal thyroid gland? What do you think is the answer to this particular question? Now, if at all you are trying to tell me that this is a patient in whom you have done a thyroid scan and the result is that it is a cold nodule, you are absolutely correct. So what is this? This is a person in whom you performed a thyroid scan and you saw a cold nodule. Now let us first understand the concept about a hot nodule, a concept about a warm nodule and a concept about a cold nodule. So what exactly do you mean by that? So see understand what you get whenever you do a thyroid scan is that this basically tells you what is the uptake like what is the activity of that particular nodule. So thyroid scan. So for, let's say if at all you have a thyroid lesion. Okay. If at all you have a thyroid lesion and if you perform a thyroid scan the like the interpretation of what you will get after the scan is over is that whether that particular lesion is hyperactive hyperactive or it is hypoactive this is what you will come to know after you have performed a thyroid scan so if at all the lesion is hyperactive what do you think will be the uptake capacity of that particular lesion? So if at all that particular lesion is hyperactive, it will take up lot of radioactive iodine. It will in fact take up more radioactive iodine as compared to the rest of a thyroid gland. And that is why you will call it as a hot nodule. But let's say if the kind of a nodule or a lesion inside the thyroid, it is hypoactive. So it will take up less radioactive iodine as compared to that of a rest of a thyroid gland. And that is why you will refer it to as a cold nodule. So I hope you understood it. If at all a particular lesion is taking up more radioactive iodine as compared to the rest of a thyroid gland, you call it as a hot nodule. And if at all a nodule is taking up less radioactive iodine as compared to the rest of a thyroid gland, you call it as a cold nodule. Now what about this warm nodule? If at all there is a thyroid nodule which has a uptake of a kind of a radioactive iodine which is same as that of a rest of a thyroid gland you refer it to as a warm nodule okay so i hope you understood the basic concept that what result do you get after a thyroid scan you get to know whether the nodule is hyperactive or the you get to know whether the nodule is hypoactive now let us come back to this particular image so if at all you just try to complete the thyroid gland like this so what you will kind of see in this particular thing is that a part of a thyroid gland it's not taking up an uptake properly but the rest of a thyroid gland the uptake is absolutely adequate so that is why this is a patient who is suffering from a cold nodule i hope you get this particular point on the other hand if you just zoom into this particular image so i'll just try to draw the thyroid gland over here for you so here let's say this is a thyroid gland so here what is happening the most of the part of a thyroid gland it is not taking up the uptake but there is just this one particular nodule in the thyroid gland where the maximum uptake is present and that is why this is a patient who is suffering from a hot nodule okay i hope you get this particular point now there is a common misconception that thyroid scan helps you in knowing whether the lesion is malignant or not that is wrong that is absolutely wrong so what i'm trying to convey is if at all the uh, lesion is cold if at all there is a cold nodule or there is a hot nodule both these particular nodules can be malignant the only difference is if at all you have a cold nodule the risk of malignancy is more okay so a cold nodule and a hot nodule both can be malignant but if at all you have a cold nodule the risk of malignancy is close to 15 to 20 percent okay so here you have a 15 to 20 percent risk of 
malignancy but if at all you have a cold like a hot nodule then what is the risk of malignancy it is 3 to 5 percent risk of malignancy i hope you get this particular point guys okay so this is something also which is important because ncqs do come on this what is the risk of malignancy in a cold nodule what is the risk of malignancy in a hot nodule so please remember this now let us move on to the next question here you have a patient who has been subjected to a colonoscopy and following the colonoscopy you get an image which has been shown and the patient also has a hyper melanotic macules on the lips so if at all you want to have a look at the image so this is uh, how the uh, hyper melanotic ma macules of the uh, lip of this particular patient look like and this is basically what you are having a colonoscopic image colono scopic image okay now what is the diagnosis of this particular patient so the diagnosis of this particular patient is it a fap syndrome hnpcc butte checker syndrome or a lynch syndrome what do you think is the answer to this particular question well the answer in fact is a butte checker syndrome please understand this okay so the whole point which i'm trying to make in this particular question is that if at all you have a patient who has a multiple colorectal polyps and along with this if the patient is having hypermelanotic macules then if at all this is kind of a clinical scenario with you then the diagnosis of this particular patient is Butte's Chegger syndrome so please understand this this is very very important now this is something which they can ask you in so many forms in a clinical scenario okay so please understand if at all there is a person who in whom you have a multiple colorectal polyps and you have a hypermelanotic macules the person has a diagnosis of a Butte's Chegger syndrome now if i just ask you what is the most common site okay what is the most common site where you get a polyps can you please tell me in the Butte's Chegger syndrome please understand the most common site where you get the polyps what is the answer to this particular question it is jejunum please understand it is jejunum and why is this butte checker syndrome so important the butte checker syndrome is so important because in this you have a risk of extra intestinal malignancies also extra intestinal malignancies so here the patient is at a risk of let's say a breast carcinoma thyroid carcinoma and a pancreatic carcinoma so patient is at a risk of extra intestinal malignancies and that is why this butte checker syndrome is absolutely must know i hope you get this particular point now let's move on to the next question here you have a newborn okay so there's a newborn child who has been referred to the hospital uh, from the primary care center with a respiratory distress if you take a chest x-ray of this particular patient which has been shown into you and uh, this basically shows that it is a okay so it shows that following a congenital defect that is fine which of the following is the next best step in the management of this particular patient so here what you are able to see is this is a chest x-ray of a patient so what you are able to see this these black colored circular things these are basically the bowel loops so there is a defect in the diaphragm and because of this what is happening the bowel loops are basically going into the thoracic cavity and what they are doing is they are basically pushing the lung and because of this the patient is landing up into respiratory distress now what is the yeah which of the following is the next best step in the management of this particular patient so do you have to go for a bag and mask ventilation because the patient is in a respiratory distress immediate operative repair okay so should you take the patient for an immediate surgery should you go for an endotracheal intubation or do you have to go for an emergency tracheostomy so obviously the answer is endotracheal intubation so you'll have to go for an endotracheal intubation and you have to put the patient on ventilator now please understand this bag and mask ventilation this is absolutely contraindicated in this particular patient okay it is an absolute contraindication why because if you go for a bag and mask ventilation okay so if at all you go for a bag and mask ventilation what is happening if at all you uh, go for a bag and mask ventilation the air is entering into the trachea air enters trachea but at the same time it 
also enters GIT it also enters the gastrointestinal tract and because the air is entering into the gastrointestinal tract that is why what is happening it is kind of comp it if at all you go for this bag and mask ventilation and because the part of air is entering into the GI tree it will basically increase respiratory distress and this is the reason why you do not prefer to go for a bag and mask ventilation in this in fact it is absolutely contraindicated you should not go for a bag and mask ventilation okay what about the immediate operative repair so please understand it has been shown that you have to go for surgery only after you have stabilized this patient after stabilization of this patient is achieved so first you need to stabilize the patient and then you have to go for a repair so that is something which you need to follow and endotracheal intubation yes definitely so you because the patient is in a respiratory distress you have to go in for an endotracheal intubation now what is you trying to like what what i'm trying to show in this particular figure this is basically a scaphoid abdomen okay so what i want to just tell you that the scaphoid abdomen is something which you get in this okay now what is the scaphoid abdomen so i hope you're able to see that the abdomen has basically kind of has this depression so why is this so in the patients of a kind of a diaphragmatic in the defect with the intestines going to the chest what is happening the most of the part of the abdomen is empty because whatever the intestines which were supposed to be here they have entered into the thoracic cavity and that is the reason why you get a scaphoid abdomen in this particular patients this can also be sometimes asked in the clinical scenario so please understand this okay so they can use this buzzword that is a scaphoid abdomen and this is what you understand by scaphoid abdomen right now let us move on to the next question a patient is suffering from a road traffic accident and the patient had a pelvic fracture now patient has no urge to pass the urine since last 12 hours and the dye studies you performed a dye study which basically revealed the following finding so what is the diagnosis of this particular patient so is it an anti urethral injury the posterior urethral injury extra peritoneal bladder rupture or an intra peritoneal bladder rupture now let us kind of dissect this particular question again so here you have a patient who is uh, coming to you after road traffic accident with a pelvic fracture okay and the patient has no urge to pass the urine now this is something which is a uh, kind of a leading point in this particular question the patient is having no urge to pass the urine so what do you think like uh, why do you have an urge to pass the urine so why do you and i have an urge to pass the urine please understand we get we have urge to pass urine because of distension of the bladder okay so because of distension of bladder what is happening we are having this urge to pass the urine but here in this particular patient what you are seeing that it has been close to 12 hours and there is no urge to pass the urine no urge to pass the urine if at all this is a kind of a thing then this tells you that indirectly the patient is suffering from a diaphragmatic sorry this is uh, this tell, tells you that the patient is suffering from a bladder rupture okay so this tells you that the patient is suffering from a bladder rupture now what is the other thing which is given in this particular patient okay so let's talk about the bladder rupture it can be either a extra peritoneal or it can be an intraperitoneal so here what they have given you that the patient is having a pelvic fracture so presence of a pelvic fracture and the presence of a, a kind of a deep perineal hematoma if at all these two things have been given then the diagnosis of this particular patient would be an extra peritoneal bladder rupture but if at all let's say they give you that the patient is having signs of peritonitis okay if at all they give you that the patient is having a signs of peritonitis then the diagnosis would be intraperitoneal bladder rupture okay so because here you have 
being given that there is a pelvic fracture and then there is no urge to pass the urine then that is the reason why you have an extra peritoneal bladder rupture and coming back to this particular dye study what you are basically seeing this this is basically a flame shaped extra visitation of the dye and this is again very much indicative of an extra peritoneal bladder rupture so please understand in the extra peritoneal bladder rupture what do you get you get a pear shaped bladder and along with this what do you get you get this flame shaped extra visitation of dye okay i hope you get this particular point okay so that is why the diagnosis of this particular patient is an extra peritoneal bladder rupture okay right now let's move on to the next question uh, a day one year old infant is coming to you and the patient is having a bilious vomiting okay and you order an x-ray of this particular patient which has been shown to you over here so what is the most probable diagnosis of this particular patient so this is something which you absolutely absolutely need to understand so what is the diagnosis the diagnosis is a duodenal atresia so let us first have a look at this particular x-ray okay so what is this particular x-ray showing you in this x-ray you are basically seeing a double bubble appearance okay now what is this double bubble appearance please understand over here what you are seeing this particular bubble this is a gastric shadow okay so this is a normal gastric shadow which is present in each and every individual so this is a fundal shadow which is basically present in every individual and what you are seeing this this is basically a duodenal gas okay so what this this second bubble is this is basically a air in the duodenum air in duodenum and that is why this particular x-ray is referred to as a double bubble appearance okay now if i just ask you uh, what are the differential diagnosis of a double bubble appearance can you please tell me what is the dd of double bubble appearance what is the dd of a double bubble appearance uh, what do you think is the dd of a double bubble appearance so we have a duodenal atresia and annular pancreas so how do you distinguish between these so in these particular most of the things will be similar so here you will have a patient who is uh, coming to you on day one of life the patient is coming to you with a uh, vomiting and the patient is having double bubble appearance so all these things will be the same the only way you can distinguish between them is based on the vomiting okay based on the vomiting if at all you have a bilious vomiting the diagnosis would be duodenal atresia but if at all let's say you have a non bilious vomiting then the answer would be annular pancreas so i hope you get this particular point uh, what you will have in both these particular things you will have a patient who is coming to you on a day one of life the patient is coming to you with a double bubble appearance and the patient is coming to you with a vomiting the only way you can distinguish between these two is what kind of vomiting so if at all you are having a bilious vomiting the diagnosis would be a duodenal atresia and if at all you are having a non bilious vomiting the diagnosis will be an annular pancreas so coming back to this particular question here what do you have you have a day one of life infant who is coming to you with a bilious vomiting okay and then you have a double bubble appearance and that is why the answer is duodenal atresia if at all in the question they would have given you a non bilious vomiting then the answer would have been annular pancreas i hope you get this particular question moving on to the next question so what is the most common testicular tumor in the fourth decade of life so pretty straight forward question what is the most common testicular tumor in the fourth decade of life the answer is seminoma please understand this okay so let us uh, look at what are the kind of a tumors of the testes which you can have in the different age groups so let's talk about the testicular tumors the age wise distribution 
so if i just ask you what is the most common testicular tumor in the infants okay so if at all i just ask you what is the most common in infants what is the answer to this particular question you would answer that it is a yolk sac tumor and you are absolutely correct so the most common testicular tumor in the infants is yolk sac tumor okay now if i just ask you what is the most common testicular tumor in the pre pubertal age group pre pubertal age group what do you think so what is the most common testicular tumor in the pre pubertal age group what do you think the answer is teratoma please understand very very important the most common testicular tumors in the pre pubertal age group it is a, is a teratoma now moving on what is the most common testicular tumor in adults so what do you understand in adults that is third or fourth decade of life what should be the answer to this particular question and the answer is seminoma okay so the most common testicular tumors in the third and the fourth decade of life is a seminoma and lastly if i just ask you what is the most common testicular tumor in more than 60 years of age what is the answer to this particular question it is a testicular lymphoma testicular lymphoma so i'll just revise this for you the most common testicular tumors in the infants it is a yolk sac tumor most common testicular tumor in the pre puberty age group it is a teratoma most common testicular tumors in the adults it is a seminoma and the most common testicular tumors in the like patients who are more than 60 years of age the answer is testicular lymphoma so this is something which you need to remember very very important okay all these four points which we just discussed they are very important please remember them now the next question which we have is there is a 18 year old woman who presents with an abdominal pain fever and the leukocytosis which uh, with the presumptive diagnosis of an appendicitis so here you have a 18 year old kind of woman who comes to you with all these signs and symptoms and the first diagnosis which you which comes into your mind is appendicitis a right lower quadrant mcburney sensation is given and the appendix actually is found to be normal and that is why you kind of explore the other parts and you basically find a lesion 60 cm proximal to the ileocecal valve okay the kind of photo of that particular lesion has been shown to you which of the following is the most likely diagnosis of this particular patient it is absolutely no brainer the answer to this particular question is that it is a meckel's diverticulum okay so what is the answer it is a meckel's diverticulum now please understand what is a meckel's diverticulum meckel's diverticulum is a true diverticulum it is a true congenital diverticulum which is present in intestine okay so this is precisely present around 60 cm proximal to ileocecal valve okay so what you are basically seeing in here this is a diverticulum this is a congenital diverticulum that is a meckel's diverticulum i hope you get this particular point now please understand what is the relationship between this meckel's diverticulum and the appendicitis so one of the very important differential diagnosis of appendicitis is it is a meckel's diverticulum so if at all your patient is coming to you with the signs and symptoms of uh, appendicitis and if you operate on the particular patient and the appendix is found to be normal the next diagnosis which you will look for is a meckel's diverticulum so it is basically a point which you always need to understand whenever you are operating for a appendicitis you have to kind of check 60 cm proximal to the ileocecal junction for the presence of a meckel's diverticulum i hope you get this particular point now this is the reason why even though the patient has a meckel's diverticulum there was an inflammation in the meckel's diverticulum but the patient came to you with the signs and symptoms which on physical examination and the lab values appeared as if the patient is suffering from an appendicitis so this is you should understand right 
now let's move on to the next question so here you have a newborn infant who was born to a mother uh, with a polyhydromenos so mother had a history of a polyhydromenos which kind of uh, and the child basically comes to you with an excessive salivation along with the coughing and the choking with the first oral freed so this particular child presented to you with the excessive salivation and the coughing and the choking when the child was uh, kind of fed with the breast milk but the mother has a history of a polyhydromenos you try to put in a nasogastric tube and you perform it an x-ray in this particular patient and this is what you saw so i'll just zoom in on the x-ray for you what do you think is the answer to this particular question so what you're able to see is that the rice tube which you had put in this is basically coiling in the upper part of the esophagus so what do you think the person is suffering from a esophageal atresia but at the same time if you look that there is a gas which is present in the distal part of the bowel so there has to be some communication between a uh, kind of a trachea and the distal part of the bowel and that is why the patient is suffering from an esophageal atresia and the tracheoesophageal fistula i hope you get this particular point do not just mark for an esophageal atresia the answer is c okay so here definitely the patient is suffering from esophageal atresia but at the same time patient is also having a tracheoesophageal fistula this is also very very important okay i hope you get this particular point okay so here the patient is having esophageal atresia along with the tracheoesophageal fistula okay i hope you get this particular point now a buzzword whichever whenever the patient might come to you with this kind of a tracheoesophageal fistula the buzzword is patient is having a drooling of saliva so whenever you get this particular kind of a thing you have to take into consideration if at all they have given a drooling of the saliva in day one of life this basically is indicating that the patient is suffering from an esophageal atresia okay i hope you get this an esophageal atresia this is something which you need to understand now uh right so if i just ask you what is the kind of a best investigation to diagnose it so how do you make up a diagnosis so you have to go for a dye study okay so you have to go for a dye study in order to make the diagnosis but there are various types of a tracheoesophageal fistula so there is one of the types which is called as a h type of a tracheoesophageal fistula so there is one type which is called as a h type if i just ask you what is a investigation of choice to diagnose this h type of a tracheoesophageal fistula this is a repeat question which has been asked a couple of times in the central institutes please understand the investigation of choice for this is it is a uh, tracheo bronchoscopy okay so it is a tracheo bronchoscopy please understand this it is a very important repeat mcq which they have asked you so h type of a tracheoesophageal fistula investigation of choice is a tracheo bronchoscopy okay right so this is something which you need to remember so this is a clinical scenario which you have got of a tracheoesophageal fistula and yes that's pretty much it uh, right let's move on to the next question by performing this manner which you are seeing in this particular figure uh, the bleeding from the liver did, did not stop so the bleeding actually continued so can you please tell me what is the source of the bleeding so what is this particular manner for like first of all let us understand what is this manner which has been shown in this particular figure so this is a pringles manner okay so this is a pringles manner so what you are seeing this is a pringles manner now please understand whatever you are doing this is to be done in the patients of a liver trauma okay so in the liver trauma so most of the times whenever you have a liver trauma you try to manage the patients conservatively so whenever you get a liver trauma most of the times you try to manage the patients conservatively but let's say if the patient is hemodynamically unstable you will have to go and explore this particular patient so when you explore this patient there can be two possibilities right there can there let's say there is a bleeding from the liver so let's say this is a liver and there is a bleeding from the liver so now we are interested in knowing the source of this bleeding so now we are interested in knowing what is the source of this particular bleeding so the source of this bleeding either it can be a portal vein either it can be a hepatic artery or it can be a hepatic vein okay or it can be an hepatic vein so the three vessels which are associated with the liver are this is a portal vein this is an hepatic vein and this is your hepatic artery so these are the three things which are associated with this liver which may be responsible for this bleeding 
Now we want to know what is the source of this particular bleeding. So that is why we perform a Pringles manual. Okay, we perform a Pringles manual. Now what is this Pringles manual? What is this Pringles manual? So I'll just make you understand what is this. So you have a liver and then you have a duodenum. Okay, so you have a liver and then you have a duodenum. So what do you have? You have a structure which basically connects this liver to the duodenum. What is it called as a? It is called as hepatico duodenal ligament. Okay, so what is this called as? This is called as a hepatico duodenal ligament. What is the content of this hepatico duodenal ligament? So in this hepatico duodenal ligament, you have a portal vein. So the one of the contents is a portal vein, then you have a hepatic artery and then you have a bile duct and then you have bile duct. So please understand the portal triad, portal triad which basically consists of the portal vein, hepatic artery and the bile duct. This is the content of this hepatic duodenal ligament. So it is no brainer if at all you are basically compressing this. What is going to happen? If at all the source of the blood would have been a portal vein or hepatic artery because you are compressing this. What is what would happen? The bleeding would stop. But because the bleeding is continuing and that is why the answer is hepatic vein. So I'll just simplify this for you. Whenever you have a Pringles, like whenever you perform a Pringles manual, on performing a Pringles manual, what do you have two things can happen either the bleeding from the liver stops bleeding stops so if at all the bleeding stops then what is the diagnosis the, the like the uh, what you know that if at all the bleeding stops after performing a pringles manual the source of bleeding you interpret that the source of bleeding was a portal vein or an hepatic artery but if at all on performing a Pringles manual the bleeding continues so if at all on performing a Pringles manual the bleeding continues then what do you interpret you interpret that the source of the bleeding was source of bleeding is hepatic vein i hope you are understanding this particular thing okay so what we are doing in the pringles manual we are compressing the hepatic duodenal ligament if the bleeding stops it interprets that the source of the blood is either the portal vein or hepatic artery but if at all the bleeding continues the like the source of the bleeding is a hepatic vein so in this particular question because the bleeding has continued the answer is it is a hepatic vein I hope you get this particular point guys okay so these were the 10 mcqs which i wanted to discuss with you uh, in this particular session i hope you like them i hope you uh, this particular discussion added some value to your life thank you so much for joining with me guys it is indeed a pleasure interacting with all of you and guys i just want to convey one small thing we are conducting lots and lots of really great courses on an academy i will request you to just click on the link there below it will be uh, it will direct you to my particular page where you will be able to explore all the courses which launched by me and also by the courses which are conducted by the other educators so please do consider them and if at all you want to join any of the particular course please consider using my promo code dr.pavan or drpavan slash yt by using this you will get around 10 percent discount on whatever the subscription you want to see so hope to see the live classes thank you so much for joining have a great day see you